Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, um, so hashtag social movements. Today's webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the presentation yourself, share it with friends, family, classmates, colleagues. Um, throughout today's event, we do ask that everyone help us out by keeping your cameras and microphones turned off. Uh, but we do invite you to share your comments and your questions in the chat box. So please go ahead, take a moment and locate that chat box on your screen. If you think of any questions or comments at any point, just go ahead and type it there. I will be monitoring chat for questions and I will either ask it at that time or I will hold it for the discussion portion of the event um, at the end. So our presenter today is Dr. Holly Cruz. Dr. Cruz received her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History from the University of Iowa and her Doctorate in Communication from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Cruz currently serves as Professor of Communications and Greg Coons Endowed Chair in Communications at Rogers State University in Claremore, Oklahoma, where she teaches courses on new media and society, media theory, and gender and technology. Among her many publications, Dr. Cruz is the author of the book Off Track and Online, The Network Spaces of Horse Racing, and is currently working on a new book titled Gender and Technology, which is due out next year. She's also active in the Association of Internet Researchers, an international organization that studies digital media, having served on the executive committee there for seven years. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand everything over to you, Holly. Okay. I am going to leave all this housekeeping, like letting people in from the waiting room to you, Caitlin, and um, warn people, I have a lot of slides, but I'm going to motor through them. They're mostly graphic. As Caitlin mentioned, I did have a history major, and so it's hard for me not to approach things like, as this is the history of everything, but I'm trying to go light on the history. Having said that, I'm gonna start out by getting past the screen. Okay. And first just point out that online social movement history, with that organizing online is definitely not new. I don't know exactly how far back in the 70s or 80s we can go and find examples. I know there are definitely uh, computer tech people organizing around specific issues online in the early 90s. Um, I wasn't a part of any of that, but I can say that I was a part of in the 1990s um, the Canine Underground Railroad, which is now kind of unfortunately named. And there was also the Feline Underground Railroad, and these actually had email lists, and these predated the popularity of the World Wide Web, and you can still see traces of them um, online, and these were set up to do rescue runs for pets, and I was pretty active in it back in the mid 90s on the East Coast. So that was pre Twitter, pre hashtags on social media, pre all that kind of stuff. Social movements, not so much, but organizing on a smaller scale using digital tools for sure. It's also important when we look at hashtags like Black Lives Matter or Me Too to keep in mind that as Angie Valdivia has recently pointed out um, that this is not brand new. Of course, these current movements or at least coalescing around hashtags or online movements that are also offline um, is rooted in centuries-old struggles for racial, gender, class, and sexual equity. And so that's an important idea to keep in mind throughout this whole talk that I'm giving. Now, in terms of Twitter itself, it started in July 
of 2006. So it's 14 years old. It, and it started with a podcasting company, corporation startup, of which Jack Dorsey was a part. And it was originally meant for communication among members of a small group using short message service, what we think of as texting. And that explains why there was a character limit and there still is a character limit. It's just longer now. You may remember, some people may remember a time when texting was pretty limited, when you had to pay more to text more, when text length was an issue monetarily. So that explains the format used for text for posts in this platform. Twitter really broke through from about 20,000 users to 60,000 at the South by Southwest Interactive Conference or inter yeah, Interactive Conference in 2007, as documented by Gawker, Ballywag, which don't exist anymore, but you can still see the story behind it. And after that, so 2007 is when it really started to be known and gain notoriety. In terms of the hashtag, it was that same year, a little later, when a tech developer suggested using the pound sign to organize tweets by topic. This was Chris Messina, and here is the tweet in which he suggested using the pound sign uh, for groups and to get people then to gather around particular hashtags as topics. At that time, hashtags wouldn't be hyperlinked in the way you see here. If you go back now and look at these early tweets, they have these hyperlinks as we have on the platform now, but back then that wasn't a thing. You would still have to search. But he suggested it and soon thereafter, there was the first response from a writer, Stowe Boyd, who supported this. And he used the word hashtag, though as you can see, as two words. And so that is the history of the hashtag, but it is important kind of to note that hashtags did predate Twitter. They were around in chat in the 1990s as a way of organizing around topics or channels. I don't know if anybody here used IRC. Okay, no one person here probably used IRC besides me back in the 90s, but it would look something like this where you see these kinds of hashtags for channels in IRC for discussion around, chat around particular topics. Oh, and by the way, if at any point someone wants to jump in, ask a question, I don't know if Caitlin will allow it, but I will certainly allow it if something is unclear or if you want to add something, that'd be great. Okay. So looking then at the hashtag itself, um, a Finnish blogger wrote a blog, The Incomplete History of the Hashtag, in which she included um, some of these important dates, like the beginning of IRC, um, Internet Relay Chat. Other people may be more familiar with like AOLs, internet, messenger, that sort of thing. And so she's got various moments in time here. Uh, she also mentions a Finnish service in addition to Twitter and its use of um, hashtags. Uh, she also notes that in 2013, Facebook finally introduces hashtags. And one thing that's interesting to note is that the platforms in which hashtags have become commonplace and successful, like Twitter, like Instagram, like TikTok, 
uh, and Facebook, not so much. But then 2014, hashtag officially becomes a word recognized by the powers that be in language. Okay, now here, don't get freaked out. I am fully aware of the time available. But I have a list here of just some of the movements and campaigns that I'm going to touch on when I saw the graphic that Caitlin, I don't know if you designed it, but contributed to with various hashtags on it. I thought, wow, I have not followed all of these. So I didn't include all of those, but I did include um, several that you may be aware of, you may not be aware of, some very prominent, some not so prominent, some which seem pretty serious, some maybe not so serious. But here they are. The first one, uh, the 2009 Iranian election, which was probably the first major international use of the hashtag in a social movement. There had been before that use of Twitter to organize around San Diego fires. Not exactly sure if that was in 2009 uh, or a little earlier, more localized, but about resources. But this was a big international phenomenon on Twitter. The Tea Party used Twitter pretty successfully to organize. The Arab Spring is much studied and was also a case um, of hashtag activism and on ground activism. Occupy Wall Street and then the other Occupy movements around the US, Canada and elsewhere in the world. Black Lives Matter starting in 2013 and actually starting on Facebook. But then I'm adding in the BTS army, uh, which I will explain to people who are not familiar with it. I do have a friend who is quite excited or adamant that I did add this and also one other that's coming up that has actually played a role in Black Lives Matter. Uh, not all men and yes, all women uh, a, a non-U.S. based one like the Arab Spring uh, and the Iranian election, bring back our girls. Me Too, which was actually not originally a Twitter campaign and started much earlier and then became one. Free Britney, I will argue for the importance of that. This is about Britney Spears. And then one going on right now, hashtag Belarus. So I will spend some significant time on some of these and not much time at all on others. But they're all important for various reasons. So the 2009 Iranian election became the first big international event that really went viral on Twitter and with hashtags. And some of the ways that it went viral, um, I think this was on June 15th, 2009, this was the most linked story or most linked, yeah, most linked site uh, on Twitter. So, you know, link to offsite this particular image and indicating that at the very outset with this disputed election, this supposed green revolution that we know, of course, failed because there isn't democracy in Iran now. Uh, but the idea was just, oh, wow, this is happening. And look at what's happening there. Let the world know what's happening. So this Sky News image, there was another one from CNN International that went big. The next day, June 16th, the most linked site was this blog by a British blogger that was telling people 
on Twitter and elsewhere, but you see the Iran election hashtag here, practices to follow to help those on the ground with the election. And it included things to do, things not to do, the specific hashtags to use, be aware of security forces setting up Twitter accounts, spreading disinformation, advising you as a user to set your physical location as Tehran and your time zone as the time zone that it was in Tehran, which I have to say, I did all these things um, and felt it was pretty low risk for me uh, and would help confuse anyone trying to track down these people who were, you know, tweeting and retweeting. So kind of quickly moving to how can you mobilize, uh, even if you're not on the ground there, even if you're in the US or Europe or Australia or you know, elsewhere in Asia. There was also the greening of profile photos um, to put this green wash. There was a filter that you could use I did this too. Uh, luckily, maybe there's no like record. You can't go back and look at people's old uh, Twitter profile photos. So I had to find somebody else. But this is what a lot of people did with their profile photos to show support. So those are all tactics that we can probably identify in a lot of movements today. That greening of the photo sort of echoes or predates really like the controversial black square that people posted it um, and became very disputed uh, with Black Lives Matter this summer. Okay, so that's what really the first big movement was. The Tea Party, which maybe people have sort of forgotten about, but in starting in 2009 and then through the 2010 midterm elections in the United States was also, or maybe not also, but it was very successful in both using Twitter and organizing on ground and making real world change. One thing that you notice when you look at the early tweets is that they emphasize person, in-person outreach, like on the ground events. So here's an example. There were no blue checks then, but here's Katrina Pearson, who's now sort of a unaffiliated or sort of affiliated with the Trump campaign um, operative then associated with the Tea Party. So you can see including here information about local gatherings. And those of you who can remember that time probably do remember local gatherings happening, tea party events in local communities, as well as online organizing. And here's another example using hashtags and also here tea party to promote breast cancer awareness at their protest. You can see how this is including various groups and proved an effective tactic because as you may remember, some of us, that the 2010 midterm elections, they are attributed, well, a lot of their, the gains that conservatives made in Congress and elections in these midterm elections were attributed to Tea Party activism. And the Tea Party Patriots, one of the groups that were promoting the Tea Party agenda and Tea Party events and continuing to do that after the election and then noted, noting how Tea Party coordinators then were meeting with these new congressional freshmen at events. And the hashtag, the first hashtag there, TCOT is top conservatives on Twitter. So this is now 20 years ago. Another event, um, 
And this is the one that it seemed like I started to notice a lot of academics studying was the Arab Spring, which started in technically like December or so 2010 and carried through most of the year in 2011, but a lot of the activism was really happening on the ground in the spring of 2011. And it used a lot of hashtags. You can see like hashtag Egypt, hashtag January 25th. That was the date that protesters pretty much took over Tahrir Square in Cairo and some other hashtags. Here's a fun fact. Hashtag Egypt was the most used Twitter hashtag of 2011, followed by hashtag tiger blood, which if we reach way back to 2011, probably remember who and what that was about. And we won't really speak of that except for maybe in the q and if you want to talk about it. So for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with the Arab Spring, here's a map through the Econ Economist uh, magazine and various press reports showing the area affected. And this is the after effects where, you know, what kind of changes took place. Ultimately, the place where it was truly successful in protesters on the ground making change and changing their regime to a democratic one was where it started, which was in Tunisia. And in other places, it was not so successful. And in some places like Libya, Yemen, and Syria, we know things were still just a mess, civil wars, failed states, these kinds of things. But this is January 25th in Cairo, in Tahrir Square. So you can see there was a huge on the ground presence. This was not a hashtag movement, you know, solely. But they were really aware of the role that social media could play. And so signs for social media emphasizing hashtags to use, where to find them, where to use them. And in this case, Facebook. And some people, like there was a publication that came out um, that noted, and these are just some screenshots of some of the key tweets that were coming out of Tahrir Square, Tahrir Square on January 25th. Active, you know, actively reporting on the ground as events were happening, what was happening in the square. Um, and so it's pretty dramatic to read through all of them, Triumph taking the bridge. And in fact, for a long time, several days, the protesters seemed successful. The police, Mubarak's, President Mubarak's police, were attacking protesters and were um, killing protesters, but the Egyptian military was not getting involved and seemed to be supporting the protesters and did not move in on them. And in fact, in the short term, the protesters were successful for several months. There were elections. Their candidate from the Muslim Brotherhood ascended to the presidency, but then ultimately the military loyal to Mubarak took control again, and that's where we are now. But the important thing to note is that Twitter allowed individuals to bypass traditional news gatekeepers. A lot of the tweets that came with reports from the ground in the Arab Spring in those various countries were ones that were composed by people on the ground, but then called on the phone to people outside of the country who then posted them on Twitter. So in terms of 
how this played out versus a traditional social movement, there were definitely movement leaders, activists, bloggers, um, other informed people, but leadership was more distributed. So there were more points of leadership, more points of information and crowdsourced to evade surveillance. And this is kind of a model that we see with whether it's anonymous or other movements like Black Lives Matter, other movements online. And as I mentioned, Tunisia was the only successful uprising. Occupy, which you may remember, I think there was a tiny bit of Occupy at RSU, but they basically modeled themselves on the Arab Spring protests and the, that model of leadership and distributed leadership and starting with Occupy Wall Street and these protests against inequality and uh, income just in, the need for income redistribution that you know most of the wealth is held by the one percent and the rest of us are in the 99 percent and the importance of bringing attention to that and that was an untenable situation and this resulted in a lot of media coverage long-term encampments and protests an awareness of using the social media here with occupy toronto so another location where occupy was you know present and explaining to the media Here's what we need you to do to make other people aware of us and aware of us in certain ways on social media. And there were encampments and Occupy was a big deal. Well, where's Occupy now? What happened? We certainly probably are all a lot more aware of income inequality. I will say it also seemed to have inspired a critic, critically acclaimed series that I watch religiously, Mr. Robot, it was based in this notion. They use Twitter not just to get the word out nationwide or globally, but to also organize local protests and stay aware of the current protest situation for people at the sites and away from the sites something we definitely see with today's movements. The movement didn't really result in any significant policy change or really affect those in power. If anything, in the past decade, income inequality has only become more pronounced in the US and in a lot of other countries. So it didn't really work. And when I wrap up, talk about why. Black Lives Matter is obviously a social movement, fully fledged, as was Occupy, that had a huge online presence. And here from their webpage explains the origins of Black Lives Matter, which I think it's important to point out started with, well, first really just Alicia Garza and then two other Black women. Uh, and it came out of their horror at the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And that was the impetus. And this Pew Research Center chart, which I'm not sure how well you can see that because the print is kind of light, but this, this chart is basically the whole history of Black Lives Matter starting in 2013. And here you see July 13th with the acquittal and not much activity because the hashtag movement website, all that was just being established, and again on Facebook first, and then the Ferguson, Missouri 
police shooting, but the lack of an indictment in the shooting death of Michael Brown. And then there was a spike here in summer of 2016 when a lot of events were taking place. And so we see we, these various spikes. Okay, so this spike in July of 2016 was the biggest until May of this year. And you can see the huge increase. And this is covering the period then in this box with the death of George Floyd. And then um, a few days later, three days later, a peak in the use of the hashtag. So it was one that had been around for seven years. And with this round, it seemed much more acceptable, though that now be, may be waning as Black Lives Matter becomes more contested and demonized in the right wing media at least, but where brands were getting on board finally with Black Lives Matter and using it. So they were certainly part of the spike. So here's Sony and they had a three part tweet about it. And here's the BTS army. BTS being a K-pop group. And I'll just, if you're not familiar with K-pop, it's not a problem, but you can look it up after this. But BTS is probably, it's a boy band, it's a Korean pop band, biggest band in the world right now, just had their first US number one. And they have a huge fanship online. Uh, and for whatever reason, a lot of which are explored in various people's analyses, like the debt that Korean pop music owes to hip hop uh, and American black culture, uh, BTS announced their solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And they have a huge global internet presence. So this was a big deal. And their followers made this a big deal online. Blackpink is the biggest all-female K-pop band. And they, too, sent out messages on social media using the hashtag to engage their fans or at least get them, well, to engage them and raise awareness. And of local interest to us, well, I'll get to that. Here's an interesting um, tweet having to do with the BTS army. So that's what the fans of BTS label themselves. Raising money, I'm not sure where this money was going to, whether it was going to bail funds. I think there was some discussion of that, but raising money to match what BTS, the band had donated to the cause. And this is in early June. But then BTS fans claimed, took a lot of credit for what happened locally here in Tulsa uh, with the Trump rally in June, with reserving a lot of the tickets, a lot of the seats, and having not many people show up. So they, and just various groups young, of young people using TikTok, claim a lot of credit of using social media and hashtags to organize to do that. A lot of uh, people who look at K-pop and the K-pop fandom know that it's like the largely like the American K-pop fans who are doing this, not the Korean K-pop fans who are not political in this particular way. But that's just sort of an interesting recent uh, side note or further development in Black Lives Matter and with people of color. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly what number this is on the list, but 
not so much a social movement like Black Lives Matter or the Arab Spring or a political movement, but the hashtag in 2014, not all men, and then the following hashtag, yes, all women. Here is poor Tim, uh, let's not call him poor Tim, but this is a typical use of the hashtag that became more widely spread, not all men. Uh, men who are feeling attacked by women on Twitter and other social media, and basically trying to say, wait, not all men are like that. Some guys are good guys. And so this is stating that not all men are sexist and or misogynist. And so being defensive. But then something happens in 2014 in May, and that is the Elliot Roger shooting um, at UC Santa Barbara, where he killed several students, many of them men, some of them women, but he left an internet sort of history of videos. This is where we start to get the idea widely spread that there are these incels, involuntarily, involuntarily celibate men, who blame women uh, for their situations and could organize around this, started to see Elliot Roger as kind of a hero. And this is where you get, say, here a prominent feminist writer pointing out and using Yes All Women not all men practice violence against women, so that's a given. But yes, all women live with the threat of male violence every single day all over the world. So the idea of this hashtag was more to share stories and bec become visible and say, yes, we know not all men are like this, but every single woman has experienced some form of sexism or misogyny. Yes, all women have probably experienced not returning someone's feelings or quote unquote putting them in the friend zone and then being made to feel guilty or maybe even threatened. Right? Or because a lot of people are reading this and thinking, yeah, we get it calmed down. Yes, all women, like we don't want to hear that. I even participated in this hashtag because I did have a hard time Im imagining a male graduate student being patted on the head after giving a talk at a scholarly conference and being in a role as an expert. And that was pretty shocking to me. And I did get a pretty good response from that. People were horrified. Okay, getting in the home stretch here. A lot of you may remember Bring Back Our Girls. This was uh, one that was primarily not US based, but was looking for a worldwide audience. So you may remember the kidnapping of about 200 schoolgirls in Nigeria, in Chibok, in that town by Boko Haram, an Islamist, radical Islamist group. And it didn't get attention even in Nigeria for a couple of months until a former minister of education brought it up at an event and uh, said the words, bring back our girls. She actually wasn't the first to tweet this though. Somebody, an attorney who was in Nigeria who saw that talk earlier in the day did the first hashtag bring back our girls tweet. And so here from Deutsche Welle, we see from the beginning of the tweet in April to then its peak in May, around May 10th, the awareness of that phenomenon. And maybe you remember First Lady Michelle Obama 
being photographed and then tweeting out this photograph showing her solidarity. Did it work? Well, from this month, one of the groups still working on this six years. And many of the girls are still missing. Some escaped, some were presumably released. Some may have been rescued. A lot of it is unclear. Um, and of course, there have been other kidnappings like this by Boko Haram. Some people have argued that this campaign actually backfired because it brought more awareness to Boko Haram and they kind of celebrated that, their visibility and how it illustrated their ability to elude the fairly corrupt Nigerian military. And also, other active activists elsewhere in Africa noted this was a good example of the five stages of Western reaction to foreign events. Ignorance, Wikipedia wisdom, outrage, hashtag solidarity hashtag, and then tedious self-obsession, right? Oh, what are we doing? We're doing this, right? And it's about us now. which really brings to the fore something that I didn't want lost in this discussion of hashtags. So many of them are, um, have originated with black women and that gets erased. Me Too is an example, Tarana Burke actually starting that campaign into, 2006, it only becoming visible really in 2017 when actress Alyssa Milano used it as a hashtag and got credited with originating it. Then, as I said, I'm just going to mention Free Britney, still under conservatorship, uh, which she can't escape. It's limiting her, even though she's 38. There's a lot of Britney fans online protesting this. They show up when she like is in court and protest in person. And lucky for you, I guess, I didn't include my slide of that. But that's an interesting use of social media and hashtags as well. And then right now in Belarus, if any of you are following this, big hashtag now showing you, for instance, how on the street people are using low-tech means, but showing people where they can get resources, protesters on the ground in Minsk, where they're protesting a corrupt presidential election, keeping their essential dictator in place for the 20 whatever year. And then tweeting out, Belarus Free Theater, not just a theater group, but also an activist group on the ground. What's been going on? Showing the protests, and these are largely women, the ongoing nature of it that we are not hearing much about in American news. The backlash against the protests by the regime. Cases of police violence. And so the person, and now I'm wrap, wrapping up, the person who's really, I think the person to look to on this kind of um, uh, topic uh, to really, I don't wanna use the word complexify, but look in a nuanced way at this sort of activism is Zainab, and I, pr I practice saying her last name, uh, to fetch a, to fetch a, I think is correct. Uh, and there she is, she's at UNC and I met her and I can't believe I stumbled over her name, but her book, Twitter and Tear Gas is continuum, continually relevant. And just a few things she points out 
movements today, because it is so easy, easy to have big data sets, have big data banks, you know, contact people on a mass scale, have hashtags, have people click on stuff. Movements can do this informally and scale up quickly. Unlike, say, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, like the initial versions of these went through long processes of organizing, years and years, decades. Today, because of the nature of these movements, because they haven't built that foundation of working together, it's hard for them to shift from like the get people out in the streets and get people to click on things and retweet and show up at events into really making institutional changes and becoming institutionalized. And that's necessary if they're going to last over the long term. And this is just a, a really useful quote from her from a TED talk she gave where they have to be able today, movements to be, go beyond just building great scale very fast and figure out how they're gonna work together, build consensus, build strong policy proposals, work politically, leverage their political power, because otherwise all of the things that they're doing are not going to be enough. And as in this month's Science Magazine, uh, an article points out that, yes, all this retweeting, greenwashing, your profile photo, this what gets called, called clicktivism is good and it leads to good things. Um, that these low cost, low effort activities are good and they're a complement to, but it's not a substitute for their offline counterparts. And we also should finally keep in mind that these platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, owned by Facebook, their goal is not to help mobilize social movements, either on the right, left, wherever. Um, they are to keep us engaged and they are to sell us as users, as audiences for their ads and for the people who harvest our data on the platform. And of course, these platforms and the hashtags can be used for negative purposes and organize even fully online for negative purposes, as was the case with Gamergate something that happened a few years ago that I'm not going to talk about in great detail, but in the time left for discussion, we can definitely talk about. And with that, I will turn things back over to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, I'm actually going to be momentarily dropping a link into the chat for kind of a post-event survey, but we do have a couple of questions. Um, let me scroll back up a little bit. Okay, I'm going to um, get out of screen sharing. <laughs> so uh, Michelle is asking, what do you think the trick is to making a hashtag go viral in order to promote one of these social movements? Okay, well, as I, let me first stop sh screen sharing. I mean, that's the magic question, right? I'm not sure if anybody really knows that. Uh, and, and that's my lame answer uh, as I try to, uh, okay, I'm not screen sharing anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I, going viral is kind of a whole other area that's probably a little more about marketing. You know, I don't know how organic it is. One thing is I'm sure knowing your audience and knowing what platform will be most effective in reaching them. Like if you know that you wanna mobilize young people, say, 
BTS fans, you know, you're probably not going to go to Facebook. You're probably going to go to TikTok. Uh, you're probably going to go to Twitter. Uh, I mean, I know like the BTS army and the Free Britney people are highly active on Instagram and TikTok. And those just because of the nature of the fandom is um, where you would find them. And, and so those are pretty cut and dry. You know, in the, with Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, that's so well established that to connect it with a current event, which is ongoing, you know, I'm sure it's, I've been busy today in meetings and now working on this and doing this talk, that I'm sure Black Lives Matter is trending in a big way again because of the grand jury uh, outcome in Louisville late this afternoon, uh, but the lack of indictments or the minor indictment of one officer in the Breonna Taylor uh, shooting and killing. So that helps and, you know, emotional labor, affective labor, this kind of unpaid labor that, for instance, the women behind Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter have done with the outreach, with being on multiple events, with merchandise, with connecting with people on the ground, you know, the on the ground element with these kinds of hashtags is huge. And I think when you have something like the Arab Spring or something like what's going on in Belarus now, you know, when you have that huge, huge event, and I haven't mentioned Hong Kong or Thailand, you know, at least for people in the region, that's always going to be helpful. If you have with Me Too, you know, Toronto Burke didn't get that to go real viral, but then when Alyssa Milano, who had already built up a big Twitter following, used it. You know, she is sort of like an influencer on social media, was able to make it go viral. So I don't know how easy it is just for like any of us to say, oh, hey, here's my hashtag. Uh, you know, I, I hope to get a lot of people on it and using it. Uh, and I think just keeping in mind that combination between offline and online is crucial. Definitely. I think of that combination, especially getting somebody with an already established following to utilize yeah. it really helps get that out there a lot, a lot farther and faster. Yeah. I, I uh, mean, I have a, I have a friend who uh, um, is, well, I have a friend who does equine history and uh, she tries on Twitter and elsewhere to get the hashtag academics with horses going. <laughs> and it, I've tried using it a couple times and it's just not a groundswell of people. <laughs> you know. Um, and I'm just scrolling through the comments here. There's a lot of disbelief over the head patting incident. Uh, and, yes, I, I, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and then another good question. Are, are hashtags also not, or sorry, let me, get the words right. Um, aren't hashtags also used um, potentially harmfully in order to harm the social movements that they were created to support? Oh, absolutely, right? I mean, we know all lives matter, which may not, you know, I don't want to attribute intentionality to all the users of it. I think it's used very innocently in a lot of ways, but and maybe it's more of a disconnect where the Black Lives Matter people would say, we're not saying that all lives matter. We're just saying, you know, what, what seems to be forgotten is that Black Lives Matter too, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, but there are definitely cases where I don't know if it was in response, it wasn't in response to a particular hashtag, but the case of Gamergate, which I think was 2014, uh, which was 
not really a response to a particular hashtags so much as particular events that happened in the online world among gamers and ended up being a hashtag used to dox and otherwise attack, harass, threaten many women in the video games industry. And I'm not gonna call anybody out or suggest they participate, but if anyone wants to know more about Gamergate, we have a real expert on it here in our chat, uh, in, the, in the audience here. So, but that was certainly highly destructive. Um, another great question we have come in. Um, how do you track hashtags and trends? Are there any sort of specific tools or resources that can be used for that? What do you prefer? Okay, I do not do like Twitter scraping. On the Association of Internet Researchers uh, discussion list right now, there's a big discussion about tools to use to track hashtags. I have just done searches for hashtags using advanced search for like the, uh, you know, particular time periods on Twitter itself. Uh, I'm a qualitative methods researcher, not quantitative methods researcher. So if somebody wanted to use uh, more advanced tools to get, you know, big data sets of hashtags and uses of terms on Twitter, then uh, I would, I can certainly point you to people who would know about that. Or if Mia knows more about that and wants to jump in, uh, then uh, she might have some ideas. Um, what about preserving this information slash hashtag um, for posterity and historical reference? Is that being sort of cataloged or done in any sort of way? Um, okay, well, I'll answer that and then I'll answer the chat, um, the, the comment from, from Mia. Okay. Uh, and she might also be able to respond to this. So in terms of um, preserving tweets, I don't know if it's still taking place. I kind of remember hearing maybe it wasn't or maybe it was, but that all of our tweets were supposed to be like cataloged or recorded or saved in the Library of Congress. Whether that is truly happening. I know people who would know that, uh, but I don't know about that. You know, my feeling is like if people have gone back and deleted a tweet, unless someone took a screenshot at the time, that's not accessible. Uh, and then Mia, the thing that I was saying was people are asking about like tools for, you know, data collection of, of, of tweets of getting like, I guess, you know, big data sets of tweets and be able to uh, be able to, you know, analyze them and hashtags and what tools might be available for that. So and then I can look at the chat. I see there have been a lot of questions. Uh, yes, yes, I, I will say in, return, in response to things in the chat, yes, K-pop stands have taken over all kinds of turned racist tweets around. It's a joy to look at some of these trending problematic racist, you know, hashtags that are trending topics and see what the tweets are from the K-pop stands. But that's pretty, be, that's pretty good, yes. So yes, White Lives Matter, I definitely saw, saw that.
All right. Um, if there are not any other questions, um, we are kind of hitting that hour mark. Um, so we can go ahead and maybe wrap up. Um, if you think of questions after the fact, uh, feel free to email Holly directly um, at hcruz, K-R-U-S-E, at rsu.edu. Thank you so yes. much, everybody. For no, and can I also say that on Twitter, I'm just at Holly Cruz, one word. So that's also a, a, probably even a better place <laughs> to reach me because I probably check Twitter more than I do my RSU email. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Don't forget to stop in and fill out that survey if you guys have a chance. It's really brief. We just want to get some feedback on uh, both this event as well as the future events that you would like to see us bring to RSU. Have a great night. Bye, everyone.